Welcome to the Kawartha Small Business Podcast, where we believe the Kawarthas can be the most thriving region in Canada for small business. So we created a podcast where we have million dollar conversations that help small business owners thrive. I'm Brian Rump from Profit Coach. And I'm Matt Garrity from Managing Digital. And we are recording from the Thrive Podcast Studio at Thrive Coworking Community in downtown Lindsay, Ontario at 18 Kent Street West. And uh, we have a very interesting guest today. We have Halsey, um, who's going to tell us all the versions of his name here in a moment. So uh, maybe uh, introduce yourself, tell us about you, your business, and we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Halsey Gonsalves, or Halsey, or Halsey, or all the various forms, depending on who you are and where you're from. Um, I'm a hairstylist and uh, been in the business for 23 years and recently moved to Lindsay and just building back up. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Why are you Lindsay? Why'd you move to Lindsay? Oh boy. Uh, that's a open-ended question. Um, first of all, just in life in general, myself and my wife wanted to slow down a bit as far as our living conditions went. Uh, I grew up in Toronto and out west in Calgary and Edmonton. I've lived across the Canada in Halifax and London, Ontario, in Vancouver and Victoria as well. And um, yeah, just the hustle and bustle of city life um, wasn't for us anymore, although we hadn't realized that uh, what happened is the in-laws got older. Oh, yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, some per personal tragedy on on my side, uh, with the loss of my brother and my daughter, uh, you tend to shift things and uh, just reevaluate, reorganize, restructure, yeah. however you want to look at it or put that. So I'd actually retired from oh, hair. Wow. Don't take that the wrong way. <laughs> Rather, I've retired twice from hair. Anyway, that's, that's a different story. Um, between that, COVID hitting, Hairstylists were the first ones to get locked out oh, or on the yeah. front line of getting locked out. And some of the last to go back in that, you know, my, my brother or my daughter had passed. And, and so I'd gone back to work for a couple of weeks and then said, okay, I need more me time. So I started working on a horticultural degree through Guelph online to keep busy, sought out counseling on the, on the other side being my wife's side. She's the youngest of three. I'm the eldest of two. What well, was two. And so my mom's eight to 10 years younger than her parents. And so we've noticed in that 10 years, things start happening mm -hmm. health wise. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys still have your parents around, but you know, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming I'm a couple of years older than you guys or by far older than you guys. <laughs> and, um, yeah, just the in-laws got a bit older, uh, stepfather-in-laws and early Alzheimer's, I think late diagnosis, mom fell down the stairs a whole bunch of times yeah. at, at the house they were in for 40 years. And the father-in-law, I believe he's got Legionnaires. Hmm. Uh, so we moved him, if you're from the area, above the old McHale's Bakery. Oh, okay. Um, and then, of course, you know, the other two are with us, and so we're doing the multi-generational living thing. Oh, wow. That's, in a big nutshell, why we're in Lindsay. More bang for buck, quieter, that kind of thing. Do you know anybody up here? Nobody. Uh, Do you know everybody now? It seems, you know why it seems that way sometimes and I'm blessed for that I've I've been introduced to some really great people in the community and they don't steer me the wrong way uh, as far as who they introduce me to um, or as far as what for, excuse me what local businesses to buy from or deal with who's you know who's yeah. on who's on board with everybody kind of thing and who who treats the community well yeah. and so on and so forth and then you, I wanted to like not take a step back, but I'm curious about like, how did you get into hair all those years ago? 23 years ago, you said. It's 33 years ago. Okay, sorry. No, 23 years, in agreement with you, Matt, I did say 23 years ago, uh, professionally fell into it. But before that, um, late 80s, early 90s, uh, me and my two best friends used to go to these Italian barber shops. And old school, you sit there until it's your turn, you know, oh, yeah. you know, um, and we get smoking. Uh, there was still smoking at the yeah, barber shops. My, me as a kid, that's my biggest memory is sitting in the 
uh, barbershop waiting and everyone smoking. Oh, uh, dude, I had a I had a Portuguese lady that used to cut my hair. This is when we lived in Little Italy growing up, and she'd have a she'd have a smoke oh, yeah. going while she had the clippers going on my head. Yeah, right, that thing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, in the late eighties, early nineties, uh, me and my two best friends we used to go get our hair cut, like I was saying, at Italian barbershops. And we're hip hop fiends. I still am to this day. I like to say, if you look at me, I'm a preppy homeboy. <laughs> I still kind of, yeah. I, I still kind of look really like I'm 12 to 50. Like I'm still wearing the same stuff that oh, I wore when I was 12 to 15. I think you kind of revert back to whatever your nostalgia or your comfortability mm -hmm. factor is, right? Um, we would get them to cut our hair, and then eventually, I was, uh, you know, Afrocentric move was going on, Afro jazz movement jazz and hip hop was going on and then haircuts started changing. Yeah. And so I'd say, well, I want Nike on one side and I want three stripes on my eyebrows and I want Africa on the other side, yeah. or I want Bangladesh, the outline of Bangladesh on one side or whatever the case is. And they would say no, <laughs> because they wouldn't want to wreck their haircuts. I got my hands up from parentheses, just in case you guys are listening. <laughs> yeah. um, so we started doing it ourselves. And um, interestingly enough, um, Believe it or not, gentlemen, I had a full head of hair. <laughs> Actually, very more coarse, uh, but very similar to Matt's hair. Mm -hmm. um, different lengths, mohawks, tiger prints, whatever. Um, Gordon is Asian persuasion. Gordon was from Hong Kong. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. That beautiful pin straight hair. And my friend Graham, I believe from St. Kitts uh, and half Scottish, and he had beautiful loose afro, all <laughs> kinds of like different textures of hair. And so I kind of got good at putting designs in or just, we started doing our own fades. And so I was a basement barber. Oh, awesome. For a, for no better use of a word <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I don't know if that came out properly, but um, as a basement barber for about 10 years. And um, my dad, you know, was a very different teenager. I, I was a very extreme case teenager, unfortunately, for my dad, who raised me at that point. And uh, he had said, why don't you become a hairstylist at one point? <laughs> and no offense to anybody, I had ignorant, yeah. in the real sense of the word, preconceived notions about what a hairstylist male was, yeah. versus, or generally, versus what a barber was. Yeah. And I, so I said, Dad, I'm not gay kind of thing. And he said, what does that have to do with it kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And off I went. So 10 years later, of course, uh, when I decided to do this for a living and I, I can get back to that, but I fell into it. Um, you know, he was like, so you're a hairstylist now. <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, all right, Pops, yeah. you got me, you got me. Yeah. Meanwhile, you know, I'm surrounded by beautiful people at all times. Yeah. Be they gay, straight, male, female, whatever. You're in this beautiful spot. You're dealing with beauty yeah, and yeah. that's a, that's a blessing on both sides of the coin for me to make somebody appreciate what they have, hopefully. Oh, and yeah. for a guy to peacock out of the salon or for a woman to strut their stuff out of the salon is a beautiful thing to behold. Um, so anyway, that's kind of a short synopsis ish of how I got into it. Um, to finish, I, was in between jobs. I had a two-year-old at the time. I was driving forklift. I was making great money. Hated every flipping moment of the, that work, but it was great benefits and stuff. And you do what you got to do for your kids, as you both know. Um, I don't know, but I, as you know. know yeah. <laughs> um, then I managed a record store, again, parentheses, because really I just partied a lot and ordered records and learned to DJ. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't a job to me. That was joyfulness kind yeah. of thing. And you know me, Matt, with my music yeah. oddities and obsessions. Um, then the record store closed. <laughs> and so I just needed a part-time job. I was registered at Funshaw College, Fanshawe College in London, Ontario. I was going to do environmental technologies work with my uncle, who is now... Rich and retired. Did I pick the right <laughs> bro? Yeah. Um, and uh, I got a part-time job at a salon, literally sweeping floors and doing shampoos. And after two months, never looked back. I was, this is what I want to do kind of thing. Just dealing with people. You really do have to like people. Yeah. Um, perhaps let yourself. Um, and that's, that's a long synopsis of how I got into it. Was that the salon you ended up buying and owning? 
No, that was years later. Uh, I started off my career in London, Ontario at a place called Deja Hair and Spa. That was there for years and years and years, um, working for a lovely couple. Um, I say working for both of them. I worked for Annette and her husband, Norbert. Um, they were both really great friends of mine. Um, yeah, I just, uh, Norbert would kind of teach me men's cuts because I, I knew how to use clippers, but not scissors. <laughs> so I kind of did all my stuff ass backwards. I mean, backwards. Um, I mean, I was cutting on the floor before I went to school, I was doing colors and stuff like that. So I was doing that. Then I went to George Brown, moved back to Toronto, mm. lived with mom for a bit, moved back to London. Um, the salon came years later. I ended up, um, working at a couple of different salons in Yorkville. Yeah. And uh, when I was at Shag, I was doing color. Yes, it's called Shag. That's a double entendre. <laughs> um, and I, then I had the pleasure of working with somebody, one of the owners years later on a place called Bang. Another double entendre. <laughs> this was intentional, wasn't it? Apparently. <laughs> um, so I ended up working at Fiorio. I decided to go to this, this wonderful salon in Yorkville called Fiorio, which is also a small franchise, mm -hmm. uh, well known in Canada, uh, well known in Toronto, definitely. Is it the biggest hairstyle salon Why not? chain in Why Canada? Not? I think I, like, I don't maybe know why... maybe at one point I think Toronto one of them. Um, you know, I don't. I'm not going to name other names, but yeah, sure. They had, they had ten salons or eight, nine salons and a and an academy at one point. Um, so I worked in Yorkville with them for 10 years, um, on and off. I say that because I moved back to London, Ontario. I wanted to spend more time with my daughter. That's where she lived at the time. And when I moved back, we had the option to buy one of the front, one of the locations. Yeah, okay. So myself and my ex-wife Daisy owned, uh, the Richmond Hill location for mm -hmm. five years. And it was a good experience. It was tough. You learn what your shortcomings are, you know, during that time period, I was also a stage artist. Um, as well as, you know, the managers or owners would go in and teach once a month at least, yeah. uh, which I think was great because you you get to pinpoint who you want to work for you later oh, yeah. kind of thing, right? Um, so, yeah, that's that's how the salon came about. Did you ever imagine yourself being a business owner? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't know what it was going to be when I was younger. Both my parents, um, highly educated, both worked for the UN at one point. Mm in logistics and as a secretary, we moved to Canada and then, you know, they took off on their careers. Hmm. Um, again, highly educated parents. And so they had dreams, typical Bangladeshi East Indian parents, like, okay, educate your kids kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I didn't know what it was going to be. Um, so I didn't have aspirations as to what what business it was going to be. It kind of fell into my lap. But at some point, and when you're a stylist, generally speaking, you have dreams and aspirations of doing certain things, whether it's TV or editorial work or movie sets or mm. owning a salon or whatever the case is. And then you get it and um, you enjoy it and it's hard and it's tough. And there's other things involved managing people, and as you well know, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, that's... Um, it was a dream. I achieved the dream. And now, and then the dream changed because once you own, then you realize, wait a minute, I want to do what makes me happy again after mm -hmm. I've done whatever aspiring I wanted to aspire to. Now, my happiest moment is behind the chair one on one. I don't have to worry about paying the water bill or yeah. whatever. I pay my rent and I deal with my clients one on one. Yeah. yeah. And that's, uh, as far as business ownership goes, that's where I'm happiest. Yeah, you often don't think about stylists as business owners or entrepreneurs, really, because you're just like, oh, they're cutting a hair in salon, but you guys are contractors, you're freelancers. That, well, it depends on how that goes, right? Mm. Uh, yeah, there's some different models. I think, to me, it's one of those, like, age-old trade businesses where mm. like, everyone you, has hair, there's going to be different people, different preferences. Price uh, points. Yeah, price points, what you specialize in. Mm -hmm. I I will say, as far as the business model aspect goes of it, yes, what you said to a certain degree, you're a contractor or you're freelance. But aside from that, coming up 
you make nothing really for the first seven years. Oh, yeah. You're building clientele, you're building your skill. And I'm not talking about your cutting skill. That is going to get better. It's how are you dealing with people in your chair? Yeah. And that's why I was saying you better like people kind of thing. You have to kind of chameleon and make everybody feel comfortable. Um, you make people feel more uncomfortable. Uncomfortable? No. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> and like, I'll tell you something Meg asked me a while ago. Sure. It's like, do you think Hal actually likes us? Or does he just like that with everyone? I'm like, I think it's both. But it's just like, you have such love and joy for life. Oh, thank you. And it's like so infectious. And I leave hanging out with you anytime. And I'm like a peacock, like you said. I, I feel, when I get my hair cut, I leave there. I feel better than I have aesthetically in my entire life. Thank you. And a so lot much. of it's because of my hair. And it's just like, you are an infectious if that's personality in the most positive way. Thank you. Just joyous. And I think that's such a special, unique thing. And um, it's so easy to refer you or tell other people about you because it's like, it's not like, okay, someone looked for a haircut, like, yeah, whatever, you can get a thousand haircuts, but like, you gotta go to hell because you're gonna feel so good afterwards. Thanks. And I think that's an incredibly unique, very positive thing about you. I will take that. <laughs> um, you, in a sense, um, that's, that's the goal, definitely. But you specifically, for instance, yeah, you're going to connect with certain people more. Sure. It's like, I, and I'll get back to this about chameleon, being a chameleon, sort of. Um, for Matt, and I've said this to you and, and, and Meg, um, the highest compliment any stylist can get as far as I'm concerned is if you, if you get your client's children, oh, yeah. who are you letting around your kid with any kind of sharp implement? <laughs> yeah. Nobody. The dentist, maybe at the doctor's office or the dermo, maybe, but that's, that's not a common thing. Yeah. Back to the peacocking thing and whether I'm friends with all of my clients. No, I'm not friends with all of my clients. You are going to connect with genuine people. I'm just speaking from my point kind of thing. Um, and to end that thought, what I used to say when I was instructing, I used to say you attract you to a certain degree to your chair. And you do. Hmm. But that can go either way. Yeah. Right? And then I changed it. Working in certain areas in Toronto, oh, yeah. being snootier or not snootier, take how yeah. y'all out there take that however you will. Um, but what I would say to my students is attract who you want in your chair. Yeah. I want good energy. I don't want dour, sour people. Oh, yeah. On the flip side of that, I'm up for the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am. I, you have the difficult client, you have the picky client, you have the client that's never happy. I'm the guy that will, I'll try to rise to that challenge because somebody should have like, maybe they just haven't had that, like yeah. that one off experience where it's like, holy moly, I, I really, damn, I look good. Or I feel yeah. really great after that energy wise, hair wise, whatever. On the flip side of what I just said, I just did fire a client. <laughs> yeah, that happens sometimes. That happens every so often. It's happened thrice yeah. in my whole career, ever. Because, uh, oh, wow. like, because, like I said, I would rather work with somebody to make them really happy, kind of thing. But it has to go both ways too. Yeah. That's, yeah. When I first started my business, I would work with anyone, and I would take any type of scope of work. You have to. I remember someone. One time was like, well, you just do cold calls for me. I was like, yeah, that's business. I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he paid me well and I did it. And yeah. Like you just take whatever you can to get where you need to. But now I'm very much at the point where I'm, I, I joke with people when I do like a discovery call, it's 15 minutes and they think that it's an opportunity for them to see if they like me. Cause yeah. I joke with the ones where I have like a good relationship after yeah. 10 minutes and I'm like, this wasn't about you liking me. It's just like, do I want to work with you? Yeah. Like, what do you like to work with? Well, what do you have to offer too? It has to go both ways. Yeah. Yeah. You want to be able to equal do your whatever, whatever yeah. be the thing that you're good at. So yeah. 
And um, I like what you said about being up for the challenge, because sometimes it is that challenge where that, you know, people come in with masks of all sorts on where they just haven't maybe found that right person yet. But then, at, you know, that only goes so far where you bridge them through that insecurity or, you know, give them what you want or embrace the challenge to do the hard work. But yeah, if they're not good to work with, then, you know, they become the person that you, you know, fire and don't work with. There it is. Yeah, you got to find people that you enjoy working with. Uh, working with, and that goes, you know, staff and clientele kind of thing. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. So I've walked into a very beautiful situation kind of thing. Um, and again, it has to go back. With, uh, I'm, I'm very fond of saying this. You've heard me say this. Lindsay has been a balm to our souls. Yeah. B-A-L-M, people. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, really a salve that's been healing for us. I think people, this goes across the board in any smaller to medium-sized community outside of a major metropolitan post-COVID. We got to work from home, right? The whole world is also going through PTSD. When Mm -hmm. you're scared to come out, you're scared to go without a mask. You're wondering why a mask, whatever. Um, There's a new influx of energies in these communities. And so I'm glad that Lindsay, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm part of it, but I'm also seeing it happen kind of thing. That's been a beautiful thing to witness. Um, you know, back to the community thing and what, what, what you can bring to it. Yeah. That's awesome. What else you want to talk about? <laughs> we, we, well, do you have any more questions? Oh, no, I can talk. Great. Great. You're like, uh, we're, you're here because you're just super interesting. And I think uh, there's like a, a business fundamental that's great. So like we've kind of covered a lot of those so far, which I think is cool without like, you know, asking specific questions about it. Because I think you're, you know, you add that value to people. You make them feel good. You're in a business where people pay for, you know, they're not paying for the labor cutting their hair they're paying for the art and the connection and they're you're paying to feel good i do say that um you can go kind of get your hair cut anywhere you want you want the five minute or ten minute haircut do it because that's what people have time for and that's what people want on the other hand if you want the experience then do that yeah there's options for it within the industry actually let me get back to that when you start you i, I kind of veered off as usual when you start, you're making nothing for a good several years, and there's a burnout rate after that. Um, back to being uh, at work all the time, I don't generally go anywhere still 23 years later without my business cards. Yeah. I don't know who I'm going to run into. I'm the guy that will say, you have awesome hair. Here's my card. I would yeah. love to work with you kind of thing. I'm also the guy that will say, if you're in love with your hairstyle, stay with them. We are, we work really hard to keep you guys in our chairs. Yeah. And I, or I'll say kudos to your hairstylist, whatever the case is. That first seven years is really hard. You're burnt out. You're doing the, the events. You're going to the hair shows. You're doing fashion shows. You're doing, hopefully, editorial work or learning or being an assistant. Yeah. Or Then there comes a point... Um, we were talking about structure and pay structure and stuff like that, right? And how it works. Um, where let's say you're making an hourly wage, right? What generally I think a good role, a good model business was, um, cause you're making hourly, whatever that is, plus your tips. Then a good way to do it and how I used to do it is, okay, now you're on commission after a year. So you built up a little bit of a clientele as a junior stylist, let's say, yeah. or colorist, or let's say you do both. So if your commission's higher, that's what you get. If your hourly's higher, that's what you get. You got a year for that. So that's now you're on year two after your first seven years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or after you have somewhat of a clientele, or if you fall into a good situation, like me moving to Lindsay, where your clientele comes quick and fast, that's great too. Then you go on straight commission. Um. Mm. And that leads to thoughts of, well, I want that other 50% that, that the franchise is getting yeah. plus your service fee, plus your taxes. So what are you making? 35, 40% of 
let's say you're charged, I'm saying $100 as a number. Yeah. Boy, you're making 35 bucks off of that? Putting in a lot of work for that, yeah. for that one hour. So you start wondering, well, do I have enough clientele to rent a chair? Does a salon offer that? Do I take my clientele and move somewhere and say, well, I want a 60-40 split. I'm bringing my clientele, but you have the facility. So I've been in all kinds of those situations. Yeah. And, and for me, what works for me, it was a little scary coming here because I had zero clientele. Yeah. Um, so how I did it here was two Aprils ago. It's just been over a year that I've been at the salon there. Big ups to Therapy Beauty Bar in wonderful <laughs> Lindsay, Ontario, <laughs> Canada. Um, I, I went in and had a chat with them. Like I said, I was working on a horticultural degree as well, yeah. which I'm doing very slowly and in my own damn time. Uh, I took a job with Hills Nurseries and Florist in town here because there is nobody better to work with and for than the Hills, horticultural wise especially. Um, uh, so I was there Monday through Friday and I decided to work at the salon on Saturdays. Now, I went on commission for that. They got, a, they got an amount, I got an amount. Because I had no, I actually had no leverage and I was okay with that. Because uh, I'm new yeah, to the area. And you, you know the Maybe I had stuff. six regular clients because I worked somewhere else for a millisecond. Yeah. And those people found me, actually, because I kind of just, that was the 10-minute haircut versus the experience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and no offense to that again. Um, so I worked Saturdays for six months, and I built up a small clientele. And the deal with them was that once I came on, I say full-time, but my full-time is four days a week these days. Yeah. Um, once I came on four days a week, then I would be paying rent for my chair. Mm. So I'm my own business within that business. Yeah. Like you said, a contractor sure. getting back to that took a long time to get back <laughs> to that. Um, for me, the, that business model worked well because again, in a smaller community, maybe the options for a mm. great person doing something that you connect with are a little bit more limited versus what was the number? I think when I first worked in Yorkville in that four city block area, there was 250 salons. Ooh, wow. That's bunkers and that's options. And that's great for business because there's competition mm -hmm. you know, down for the competition. Mm -hmm. uh, so that business model worked for me uh, because they're very busy. They share clientele. They'll suggest, um, you know, if you're booked up a couple of months, you don't want your clients to wait for that haircut if you're yeah. doing their color. So as a suggestion, maybe you should see that house hey guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's how it went over here. And it's been, it's been really great. I've kind of got a foolish clientele already. I've been on the, on the floor for six months and again, right timing post COVID. Yeah. Lindsay, the people you're meeting, the people you're working for, it all comes into play as we all know. It's a challenging business to scale because Absolutely. you can only, how many haircuts can you do in a day? 10? I can do lots of haircuts. More than 10? Yeah. But like, what would you want to do in a day? Really? I just want to, eventually what I'd like to do, I don't think this will happen, but one hour, one client, that's it. One hour, one client. But other people don't want that hour. Yeah. They want to be in and out. So you, you kind of like, you make notes in your files or whatever of, of wow. who's doing what. That's so complicated. I hate that. That's not complicated. <laughs> to me, like my, the way my brain works, like I hate it though. Like that, for instance, with you, Matt, I used to book an hour for Matt for the first couple of haircuts. We've done what, five, maybe six haircuts now? Yeah, maybe. sure. For the first two to three, I booked a full hour with you because I trim his beard and I shoot stuff with yeah. him. <laughs> I shoot the breeze with him <laughs> and I cut his hair and on a side note, people think short haircuts are like zip, zip and get out. Now, if you go to a 10 minute place, maybe it is. It takes me way longer to do a short haircut than a long haircut. And I'm just talking about the cutting part of it. It's yeah. picky work. Yeah. Um, beard work. You screw up a beard, you screw it up good. You screw up a short haircut, you screw it up good. So sure. it's way pickier, but now I know I just need 45 minutes with him because I'm used to his hair and I know how it grows out and I'm used to doing what I do with his beard and whatever the case is. And we're chatty so, though too. I bet you we could do yeah, like I don't, 10. 
Yeah, <laughs> not ten. But like, I could fun. probably it's... finish Matt's hair and beard in half an hour. But again, it's that experience thing. I don't want to feel rushed doing his hair, and I never yeah. want him to feel rushed. Yeah. Like I'm getting him in and out. Yeah, not for what I charge. Money maker. Not for what I charge. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. It is true, and like. I, I don't know if you were kidding or not, but no, I, I'm, I'm serious. When we look at your uh, marketing, you know, you get recognized uh, from the podcast a lot because people are like, oh, like you have a distinctive look that people recognize. So it's like marketing. Uh, what I'm really saying is whatever you're paying isn't enough. Uh, the price should really be going up. It's like how yeah. already gouges me. I didn't know if you were kidding or not because I completely agree. And <laughs> I, I I go out almost every time in public thinking it's a marketing opportunity. It is a horrible maybe way to think about it. But I dress a certain way. Um, I always just dress like this: jeans and a t-shirt. I don't dress up. I uh, this is just how I am. If I'm at the market on Saturday, getting my hair done, groceries, working. If I have a massive client pitch. I'm wearing this. This is just who I am. And hair to me is so important. It to me is the thing that people see, I think, almost first. It's one of the things, definitely. And for you, it might be beard, not so much anymore. True. Yeah. Now we're looking at pretty peepers again. (laughs) (laughs) But like to me, that's why when my hair is like, if I go four weeks, it's too long for me. And I get uncomfortable. And I think that. Being uncomfortable affects my mood, my attitude, and how I'm presenting myself. Versus when I get a haircut for those first two to three weeks, like you said, I'm peacocking all around. I am just like full of myself. Last uh, week, because like I'm married last week. How about we say positive energy? And like, I can't get my head through door frames. Like I'm just, like, so happy, right? And I love it. It just make, it makes me more confident business wise. I didn't realize we're gonna, mm-hmm. like this was going to come up, but it's so true about like looking good, and having great hair. Like it it's makes even me how feel... you, it's how you feel too. Like, oh yeah, I know. For me, I don't have a lot of hair, but like people will joke if it gets a bit too long, like I don't feel very good. It's also not easy to like you know you go to the the super cheap place and then mm-hmm. you screw it up. <laughs> like no, is this long for you? Uh, no, no, this is uh, I got hair. Cut last week. See, this is long for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm a once a week. I, I try once a week. Or if you see me in hats all the time, it's because I haven't cut my hair. Yeah. Um, it is a very personal thing mm-hmm. um, as to how neat or not neat you feel. Um, and in kind of on the flip side of what you guys were just saying, as a hairstylist, I'm in the beauty industry. You better not look like a schlepper. Yeah. Um, I pick one day out of the week to be really fancy. Yeah. And that Saturdays, I used to say to my staff, that's generally or should be the busiest day of any day at a sal- at a salon. Sure. sure we can. People are free. Right? So what? You're going to come in and get your hair done with somebody who looks like they just rolled out of bed? Yeah. That doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. You're relying on that person for your look. And like you said, Matt, it's one of the first things. You're going to look at outwardly, right? Hair, eyes, clothes whatever um so look the part be the part act the part i know that's cheesy but i really feel that way it's true like people think marketing is about creative and pretty things and if they see me and my hair is just out of control and i've got a stain on my shirt they're gonna start thinking like is this guy gonna be paying attention to my marketing to the details. The details. Yeah. And I th- I tell people, everyone that I work with, like all the contractors, like we are a detail factory. Like we're not even doing marketing. We just have to get all the details, right? We yeah. can't spell things wrong. Lines have to be in the perfect spots. Like it's just details. Everything else is, doesn't even really matter. It's just the details. Yeah. And I think that- Well, like everything else falls into place if the details are there, right? Sorry, go ahead. No, like, yeah, exactly. Like it's just, that's, if, if we're having people second guess, like something, if they're seeing, again, that stained shirt or hair that's a mess, they're like, you don't even want to create that doubt in their mind. It's the same way with you as like a stylist. Like Absolutely. If I walked in, you just had a pizza stain on yourself and looked all the shit. I'm like, that's not cool. I remember years ago, I was like a teenager or in my 20s, we had like, we went to this fancy restaurant with a handful of our friends on New Year's Day. 
where was that? Mount Tremblant. And it was like a Japanese restaurant, really nice, really fancy. It was New Year's Day because the waiter got there and was like, hey, I'm so-and-so. I'm so hungover from last night. And in right my mind, I'm like, yeah, yeah, like, I was just in my head, I was like, why would you introduce yourself that way? Like, immediately now, I'm like, he's if he drops a drink or does this and that, I'm like, this guy. Yeah, you're an edge. I'm mm. like wondering, like, what happened to this guy? And it's just a bad little thing or, like, seed to plant people's minds. Yep. So. Yeah, that's a good bridge of uh, yeah, showing up, being who you want to be. You know, it's about more than just yeah, the labor of getting your your hair cut. Again, the experience part of it, um, I, it's, it, it is unreasonable to me for anybody to look sloppy at a salon. Yeah. Um, do you I, think uh, when people say the word the experience, do you think sometimes people getting into that business maybe overthink it and think they have to maybe create an experience with some sort of preconceived notions versus just creating the experience that's like organically them. Mm -hmm. um, mm, sometimes, but I think that's a learning, that's a learning curve. Learning you through. know, when we first had the salon, we ran it a certain way. Yeah. And then after six months or a year, it's like, mm, okay, let's change this. This doesn't work. Like with any other business, right? Yeah. Figure out what works for you and your clientele. Yeah. Um, or, you figure out what works for you. This is what I have to offer. Yeah. Does your clientele like that? Yeah. Or that's where you cater to. You find the client. That yeah. to me is the beauty of like the hair industry and why. It's wide and varying. When I study um, you know, business and even if you look at, there's like a downtown revitalization study for, I think there's one for Mimi, Lindsay, Fenlin, Bob Cage. And part of that study is like demographics and types of business. And there's always a, you know, this many people live here. This is how many haircut chairs you need mm. to yeah. service that population. But, yeah, but with, how much walk by is there? Blah, blah, but blah. With, but within so that, so forth, but yeah. you need the whole spectrum of choice, yep. right? So you need, to me, I would encourage people to like, you know, be your personality, set up the place you want to be. Yep. Because yeah, I could walk by the big, ch like, you know, I don't have much hair, but like, I don't go to the big chain places that are inexpensive where you just feel like it's a factory like it you know for the 10 minutes i'm there or five like <laughs> i want at least to be an enjoyable Absolutely. experience so you want to have those so if you're listening to this thinking about getting in and overthinking all these details it's like i be the person you are and i'll answer for me um over the course of the years i think a hair salon should look like a jewelry box, ah. meaning you open it up and you can see everything. So when you look at the salon that I work at, look through the front window. Guess what? You can see all the way through the back, through to the back, yeah. rather. Um, your clientele, I've been to salons where it's closed off in the front. You can't oh, really, yeah. you can't, like what's going on back there? Show your people. It's, I can lick the floors, they're so clean. The baseboards are clean. Details, Matt, right? Oh, yeah. Look around kind of thing. The mirrors are clean. Guess what? The bathroom's clean. So on and so forth. This person's getting color. That person's getting a blow up. This person's getting a shampoo. Whatever the case is, that person's getting her nails done or he is getting their nails done or they are getting their nails done. However, you know, you should be able to, in my opinion, look through the front window or walk through the door and see everything that's going on. There shouldn't be anything hidden because it's a very personal yeah. thing. People are touching you, breathing on you, whatever, like washing your hair, so on and so forth. So I did, I mean, I guess I'm agreeing with you kind of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that's definitely important. And as you say that, I was thinking about just places I've walked by where it's like, I have no idea what is going what on in, like there. in there or like, is this a cool spot? Um, this semester, I, I teach at Fleming, and some students did like uh, they were applied projects class, and they were learning about different businesses, and had them pick businesses they liked. And I don't know if you've been by Henry's Barbershop in Peterborough. No, nope. it's on Hunter Street. And oh, that's one of the main streets. I, I'm still learning, guys. Sorry, it's a little uh, cafe district. It's great, but they have a. It's like a vibrant, like nightlife type of barbershop where it's <laughs> like you go like Friday night and you can't get a spot, and it's like. Yeah. 
you know, I remember the one um, students just like, oh, so awesome there. Like there's good music playing and just like, just love the vibe. And it was so neat to watch these young kids sort of get excited about that. Cause like, you know, 20 years ago in Peterborough, like it was all old guy. I love, I love that you just shared that. But yeah, yeah, just such a cool spot. Um, again, they found their niche yeah. kind of thing. Um, on that note, yeah. when I first started in London, Ontario at Deja Hair and Spa, Wednesdays, the salon would kind of close around three or four, but then there'd be three or four stylists there. Yeah. And the clients coming in on Wednesday from four o'clock to eight o'clock knew we'd have a DJ in there. We'd have guest DJs come in. Yeah. We, that's the day like fun. Let me rephrase that. That's the day people would come in with funkier hair. Generally speaking, <laughs> generally, it was generally a younger crowd. Like you were saying, the students got excited about seeing Henry's doing so well yeah. and just the vibe that's there kind of thing. So we created this different vibe. Sometimes we'd have hors d'oeuvres kind of thing or champagne and hors d'oeuvres or something. Yeah. It was just a different kind of flow. Um, and that helped me gain clientele really quick in the university segment kind of thing when I was in London. So that's, I think that's a great, that's, awesome. that's a great flip of an old school barber shop. We've seen a lot of that, right? Um, do you think personality is coming back and or, or existing better? I, I think of the older generations and I go to a family reunion now and there's some like, you know, it's all retired people. But if I start mm -hmm. looking at people's hair, there's pops of color everywhere. People aren't afraid of like the pink or the purple streak. Whereas, you know, in the 90s, every haircut was kind of the same. It was like Rachel. firm hairspray. Yeah, the Rachel. <laughs> and now it's like, I mean, I love it. I think it's just the art. And I don't know if it's a product that people want it or if just there's hairstylists out now who are, you know, just experimenting the people more. that were in their here's one way to look at it the, the people that were in their because we're seeing a lot of like 60 to 80 year olds do that right yeah they're not scared to do that whereas before it was like you'd see old school I'm oh, going very like old you school. can't do that in the office no yeah, 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 yeah. so business has changed that way yeah. but <laughs> those people that are now 60 to 80 they're in their forties and fifties then maybe pushing 60. Yeah. So the mindset's different and they're open to like, I'm a Leafs fan and I got white hair. You know what? It's the playoffs. Let's go. Yeah. We both know that's not happening. Then there's Edmonton <laughs> <laughs> or these guys. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. I, I, I love seeing, I love seeing whether somebody likes it, whether you like looking at it, you, me, the fact that people are doing it and have the gumption, the want, the confidence, the change in attitude, like what you were yeah. saying is, I think that's beautiful. Be you. Be you, however that is. You might be the most demure little, little thing, <laughs> right? And you take your hat off and it's, ow! Royal Bengal tiger print, whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, um, I like that we're seeing that. Yeah, I think it's just a lot more open mindedness. I think it's also just, you know, as I th think it loud, like, you know, you are kind of the you store, right? You're not the, the place you schlep into to get your hair cut. It's like, it's like the place you go to buy, buy you. Or ah, like one of those places. That's a great like, way to put it. Yeah, the you store. Yeah. How can you front and show you more? Go see how say. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever the case is, right? That's and, cool. Yeah. So three people walked into Thrive yesterday. Sounds like a joke, but it's not. <laughs> three, three people walked into Thrive. Um, in all seriousness, two of them had like bright colored hair, like reddish almost, more red than pink. And then the other one was purple and green. And then the other person just had, quote, regular hair. And I'm like, why do you look like you're the one that's out of place here? <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Yeah. But I wonder what that shift was, like where people are more comfortable displaying their personality. It was just I think it was, to me, it's like one of those rules that maybe was never a rule because everyone's mm -hmm. like, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. But I'm a pretty boring, vanilla looking guy. I prefer hanging out with, like if I see someone with like 
<laughs> colorful hair or different things like that. Like that's where I'm going to gravitate to. Like those right. are interesting people. And I want to be like, yeah, look at you. You're <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Versus like, like I never am like, oh, that person dyed their hair. There must like, be. Again, at, this, at the risk of sounding morbid, that really overly conservative generation, as far as looks go. Yeah. They're gone. Yeah. True. So guess what? Be you. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to be constrained. You can have fun here and go to work. It doesn't have to be like this. It can be like this Yeah. kind of thing. You can have a beard at work. Yeah. Oh my God. Did you, did you grow your beard out and you work at the bank? What <laughs> okay. kind of like, I just, it's not on for me. Um, I'm dealing with the person. I don't, yeah. This, this is bonus for me. I'm seeing your, I'm seeing your personality. Yeah. It gives me clues to what I'm going to deal with here. I worked uh, this is a quick last story. Someone had worked at the bank and there was all these, you know, rules that maybe weren't rules. And I worked with somebody who was, you know, past due for retirement, but like staying around who was heavily tattooed. Yeah. And one day she was just like, you know, my whole career, everyone's like, Oh, you'll get fired if people see your tattoo. So she always wore like, long sleeves and like long yep. collar stuff because she had some you know i think like a betty boop on her neck awesome. and then like one day she just started like you know wearing what she wanted to wear and like everyone loves it the year before the package came uh yeah well I'm just the, the package didn't <laughs> do they even exist anymore <laughs> yeah, she kind of skipped she was hoping for the package and yeah yeah quite she was kind of challenging them to like <laughs> right, right, give right. her the, the package but uh yeah it was just a neat thing it's like yeah be you and then all of a sudden everyone's like excited by it because there's this like because somebody's right. being them whoever yeah. heard Covered well you say you're conservative whatever first thing i noticed i was like look at the socks and shoes on this guy i knew you, you were you. coming in today so I also your that. frames are just amazing oh anyway. thank you shout <laughs> out to uh eye care center for those eye care center where's that uh kind of over near giant tiger Right here, baby. Yeah. That Rudy guy. Yeah. Uh, Cassie, what up? Big yeah, ups. Cassie. Yeah. <laughs> and Karen at the desk. And Dr. A. He's probably the best optometrist I've ever yeah. had in my life. Awesome. That so Jim Ng is amazing. That's a personality. Personality. Yeah, Cassie ordered these special for me. I was like, She's amazing. I she's need a, a second pair of glasses that's got some personality. And she she's got a good eye, that lady. Um, I've had nothing. It's nervous going to new, it's nerve wracking going to new people, yeah, whether it's hair or whatever kind of thing. Yeah. And they made me feel, uh, they made me feel so special, they made me feel absolutely comfortable. Jim Ng, chameleon, talked to me like he was my homeboy, oh, yeah, because he's an old school homeboy, yeah. so <laughs> you know, blind what he looks so like homeboy. kind of thing. Yeah. He just absolutely absolutely made me feel so at ease in that you're getting drops in your eyes things on your head whatever oh, right yeah. watch the lights um yeah just i mean agree it's yeah. a great spot yeah, it's a great spot <laughs> <laughs> all right what's um where, where, where can people find you i am at three kent um on the corner of lindsay and kent street in beautiful downtown Lindsay, Ontario at Therapy Beauty Bar. Awesome. And Matt, one thing you want people to know about you and where they find you? Not enough people know that your business exists. I can help you get found on Google in less than 60 days. Go to my website and book a call at mattygdigital.com. All right. And I am Brian and I want to be known as the business coach and teacher that helps your business get money with grants, increased sales, and streamlining your business for revenue and profit. You can find me at profitcoach.ca. Uh, Matt and I collaborate to help you start, grow, or recharge your business, and we want to work with you. Uh, if you want to discuss working with us or be a guest on the podcast, send us an email to set it up at kawarthasmallbusinesspodcast.ca. And remember, we believe the Kawarthas can be the most thriving region in Canada for small businesses.